myself there. Um, we got Carly, so we're good. We have a pianist, and what more could we ask for? Um, good morning. My name is John Driesen. I am the lay leader today for this service from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. We're a welcoming home in which you can grow your own spirituality. We have no creed, but we ask that all who come respect the inherent worth and dignity of others that they encounter. That is the root belief of Unitarian Universalism. We have no prejudice. We welcome all with open arms. Are there any announcements for the good of the fellowship? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, I could say that uh, thank you for everyone who sent um made phone calls or sent letters to your legislators about house bill 2207 which is the, the power grab by the legislators to uh, control the redistricting process by legislators only with no oversight by uh, governor by courts or by citizens so this uh is not over it is just been put on hold until about the 24th of January when the House gets back in session. The Senate goes back in session, um, I thought someone said the 19th. Uh, so they will be doing probably uh, House Bill 38, which is uh, legislators again taking into their own hands the right to um, make judicial districts for statewide judicial elections, which is also a very bad idea. Um, so we have to oppose these things. And I urge you all to pay attention now, read the paper every day and make sure you understand um, that the power of our democracy is being infringed upon in Pennsylvania and we have to stop it any way we can. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that comment. And of course, as we've said before, this is the tip of an iceberg which is uh, afflicting the entire country. Uh, we're a local government is gonna take control of the electoral process, which will affect all elections at all levels. Emily, if you could um, light something, whether it's a chalice, a candle, or a lighter. And while we try to execute the plan, uh, the chalice is a symbol of our faith, uh, is lit with each service and any major event, whether it's administrative or worship. So may the light that we have kindled shed warmth and illumination to all who are within. We ask that we hopefully by so doing will energize our spirituality and open our hearts to growth. And as to steal a line from Alan Poulet, this is where we now enter the more formal part of our service. Uh, so we ask people to keep things that are noisy quiet, to hopefully quiet as we would say the monkey brain that we live with we, in our busy uh, often disruptive society where our minds are going in 20 directions. Uh, we ask if possible for the next half hour to 45 minutes that we can keep our minds clear and uh, focus on the events of the moment. So I'm gonna begin with what I call a cautionary story. This is something I heard a long time ago. It is totally fictional, but it, I think speaks to the topic of the day that what we do to our genes and today may affect 
society in the distant future. So there is a mythical story of a time in history when mankind has developed a technique whereby people can be sent back to the past and actually in the story it is to hunt a dinosaur, the feeling being that if you take one shot and something happens to the dinosaur, you probably will not have affected the long view of history, the long arc of history. Um, but the one caveat is that you are on a pathway which is suspended for you electronically or by some unknown technology. So you cannot ever come in contact with anything that's living in that generation of time for fear of causing uh, a major change in the timeline and the future. And so it went that many folks had gone back in time and had done their thing and come back and told stories of what they encountered. And they returned to a time and a place in their history where things had not changed. But as things happen and things go wrong, such a person was on such a trip. And in the course of walking along the pathway, was not careful and briefly stepped off and then stepped back on, looked around and thought nothing had happened. And upon, re upon return to his present, found that many things had changed. I don't recall they were defined but it was a very different present than he had left. And he was wondering what happened. And when he took off his shoe, he had stepped on an insect or something of that nature in the course of it. It was stuck to his shoe as evidence when he returned as having taken the life of a little tiny creature and it made all the difference in the world. That little tiny change of whatever it was somehow you know, was fated to affect or be part of the future genetically of human history. And so as we talk through the rest of our service about different things concerning cloning and genetic modifications, abortion not quite so pertinent to this discussion, although perhaps um, we should keep that in mind as we go forward. So Reverend Cheryl, if you have something you wish to pass along to the children, uh, we I think may have some hopefully listening in and we're all ears. Good morning, it's good to be here with you this morning. At some point, the children will get a craft courtesy of Oriental Trading, which is um, stars that you can scratch off and make snowflakes out of. So you'll be receiving those at some point. But if that's not available today, you can do what we always did as kids, which was to take a square of white paper, fold it in four, and then cut it out to make a snowflake of your own. Now, I happen to be one of those people who loves winter. And one of the reasons I do is because of all the different kinds of snowflakes out there, that if you would be able to look at a snowflake close, 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 close up, you could see that they actually have shapes like the ones that are on the screen. And they all kind of branch out from the center. And I don't know if you could make a snowflake that looks like that. You could certainly try but it re always reminds me of how different people are, how different we are. And that even though we're all different, we're all very beautiful in our own unique and special way. So today, if you have a chance to make a snowflake or cut out a snowflake, or even tonight, there may be some honest to goodness, real snowflakes in various quantities. When you see them, take some time to think about how you're different and you're special and maybe you can talk about that with your family. So that's what I had for the children's time. Very good. I couldn't have said it better myself because I would, have known what, would not have known what to say. So um, Carly, we're gonna do our first hymn, which is gonna be number eight, Mother's Spirit, Father's Spirit. Give me a moment. Uh, Emily's gonna try to put on the screen the lyrics. This is one of my most favorite hymns from our prayer book, uh, our hymnal because of the sacrifice that this minister made when he was uh, in a concentration camp, having, if you want to call it, paid the ultimate price for his beliefs, as so many did during World War II. I'm just going to read the first a paragraph, which is now on your screen. I think it's haunting. Mother spirit, father spirit, where are you? In the sky song in the forest sounds your cry. What to give you? What to call you? 
What am I? One can imagine a man, this may have been written before his time in Auschwitz, but you can imagine that going through his heart and soul as he is in a situation where death is uh, impending. So call if you would please, two, two go rounds, two stanzas worth of music. Thank you. Music is uh, a bomb for the soul. So I have two readings which will address uh, two of the issues that Reverend Shaw will discuss uh, in his sermon going down the line here. Uh, the first will be with regard to something off of Wikipedia, which is always a great source for a quick uh, commentary. And this is entitled Ethics of Cloning. In bioethics, the ethics of cloning refers to a variety of ethical positions regarding the practice and possibilities of cloning, especially human cloning. While many of these views are religious in origin, some of the questions raised by cloning are faced with by secular perspectives as well. Perspectives on human cloning are theoretical, as human therapeutic and reproductive cloning are not commonly used. Animals are currently cloned in laboratories and livestock production. Advocates support the development of therapeutic cloning in order to generate tissues and whole organs to treat patients who otherwise cannot obtain transplants to avoid the need for immunosuppressive drugs and stave off the effects of aging. Advocates for reproductive cloning believe that parents who cannot otherwise procreate should have access to this technology. Opponents of cloning have concerns that technology is not yet developed enough to be safe and that it would be prone to abuse, either in the form of clones raised as slaves one can think of Brave New World, or leading to the generation of humans from whom organs and tissues would be harvested. Opponents have also raised concerns about how cloned individuals can integrate with families and society at large. Religious groups are divided, with some opposing the technology as usurping God's place and to the extent embryos are used, destroying human life. Others support therapeutic cloning's potential life-saving benefits. Cloning of animals is opposed by animal groups due to the number of cloned animals that suffer from malformations before they die. And while the meat of cloned animals has been approved by the US FDA, its use is opposed by some other groups concerned about food and safety. I would point out, by the way, my daughter lives in England, and I believe that this, the EU is very much opposed to this process. Um, all right, well, well, having made that somewhat grim commentary, it is now time for sharing of joys and concerns so that by sharing your joy, that joy may be spread to all of us who need more joy and the pain can be shared as all of us have some capability to hear that pain and to absorb it and lessen your burden. So anyone who has a joy or concern to be shared with all of us, please feel free to unmute yourself and offer your thoughts. Well, if, and no one else is speaking, I have a great joy. It's just one in a bucket, but my sister has finally decided to get the vaccinations and she has scheduled shot number one and two. There's two more in her family that need to do it. And so maybe when, I don't know if that'll happen, we'll as a family be able to get together again, but one radical conservative down, how many to go? And I love my sister. My sister's a wonderful person. She just, I don't know what happened politically. <laughs> Reverend this Dave. is tri trivial in the great scheme of things, but <clears throat> last night the microwave stopped working. Can't, 
I forget what's wrong with it. Okay, and I have one concern. Uh, it was in the paper this morning. Um, you know, we thought the Cold War had kind of dissolved itself, but here we are again with many hundreds of thousands of Russian troops massed on the border of Ukraine as a threat, um, which sounds bizarre because Russia would choose to invade a country and take it over while claiming their concern is a threat, which is only theoretical of NATO uh, at its borders. Uh, and, you know, I keep on wondering about the sanity um, of the world when these things happened. I'm only hopeful that somehow diplomacy will take us off the brink and it will not be the shedding of blood and lives in Ukraine. And so we ask that uh, the joys, concerns that are shared somehow be observed by a higher power such as we believe and that those who do not immunize will do so before they suffer the ultimate consequence as one of my uh, coworkers did and who passed on from COVID and that the joys will be spread amongst society and the world in general. And now I have my second reading. Uh, this is with regard to genetic engineering. Genetic engineering, also called genetic modification or genetic manipulation, is a direct manipulation of an organism's genes using biotechnology. It is a set of technologies used to change the genetic makeup of cells, including the transfer of genes within and across species boundaries to produce improved or novel organisms. New DNA obtained by either isolating and copying genetic material of interest using recombinant DNA methods or by artificially synthesizing the DNA. A construct is usually created and is used to insert this DNA into the host organism. The first recombinant DNA molecule was made by Paul Berg in 1972, combining DNA from the monkey virus SV40 with the lambda virus. As well as inserting genes, the process can be used to remove or knock out genes. The new DNA can be inserted randomly or targeted to a specific part of the genome. And I'll make an editorial comment, as you know, using the so-called CRISPR technique, a Chinese scientist was roundly denounced by the world having played with the genetics of twins, if I recall in China, trying to put in a gene that would make them impervious to the HIV infection. Uh, so we've already had an event whereby these individuals will go down through genetic history with that gene and hopefully will not perturb the timeline. A natural selection, works slowly and painfully slow sometimes, but it is a natural technique. I would also point out that I was taught in medical school a very long time ago that much of the human genome of DNA, if one looks carefully, was caused by the interpolation of various viruses over the course of human history and somehow inserted itself to become a presumably useful and not to a part of our genome. But that was happening by random chance, not by human intervention. And I guess I would comment, are we mature enough as a human society to use such technology in a way that would be beneficial? Can we do it without jeopardizing human future? And I will leave that to, uh, to Reverend Shaw's commentary, which is coming shortly. So Carly, if you can play the next hymn, Amazing Grace, maybe two go rounds of that uh, as we offer people the chance to uh, contribute to the financial welfare by way of collection. We do have our online uh, electronic technique, which you can avail yourself of. It took me a while to figure that out being older, but it does work. Uh, this is for the financial well-being of our fellowship. As I told Emily, I had printed out the verses for the hymn Amazing Grace, and actually, uh, apparently, the original Amazing Grace poem by John Newton has 13 verses in it, not the usual four or five that most will sing. So I would commend you to take a look at that because there's a great deal of other uh, information buried in the hidden verses. So Carly, if you would, please.
Okay, thank you once again. Music is always again a wonderful balm for the soul. So I'm going to introduce our um, guest minister. Uh, you did read something about her past in the blurb in the Sojourner and the information for the service itself. And I would add that we're going to leave time after her sermon intentionally, because I believe, I would hope that we'd have people who would like to comment and offer feedback about what I've read and about she will, what Cheryl will tell us. But just a, an aside, um, so many years ago, I had a patient in my practice who unfortunately had developed advanced colon cancer. This was before the days when we knew what we were looking for. We weren't doing screening colonoscopies. And so unfortunately, most of my discoveries of colon cancer ended in tragic death because they were a bit late and metastases had occurred. And there was such a lady and I can still see her face and her husband's face, but I, you know, for anonymity, I don't remember who she is and we'll leave it at that way. I had promised her husband as I have to many patients that if someone passed away overnight, that I would go to their house with a death certificate so we could avoid the parade of red lights outside the door. We could avoid having the coroner come because I could make the pronouncement of death. They could simply call the funeral home and transfer the body to the mortuary. And so this lady did pass away in the wee hours of the morning, one, two or three o'clock as it may have been. And so I came to the house, death certificate in hand to do you know, my duty. And there I met Cheryl, um, who was at the time a minister of the Bethany Evangelical Lutheran Church just down the road, which these, uh, these folks attended. And thus became a bit of a mutual admiration society that we both understood our role in our respective types of ministry. And thereupon began a friendship that has continued into the present day. Um, and with that, I would uh, ask Reverend Cheryl to uh, offer her sermon. Thank you. Just for fun, I looked that up in my book that was in 1987. Oh. So I have it. So at any rate, good morning. I had hoped to have the chance to meet with you all this morning, but given where we are in the world right now, this is the way it is. So um, at any rate, I'm Cheryl Meinshine. You've heard or read something about my mixed background with a degree in biology, theology, and most recently a certificate in paralegal studies. I have no idea what I'm gonna do next, but it'll be something. And there's my mixed religious background with a Lutheran father and a Jewish mother who became a Lutheran, although I'm convinced that once a Jewish mother, always a Jewish mother. At any rate, I'm here thanks to John Driesen, my formerly my former family doctor when I moved to Berks County from New Jersey, who you could guess you could say I've known longer than I haven't. And the second way I got here is through Lisa Jo Keel, who is the musician at the church where I started out. So I had an opportunity to meet her as well. So this morning we'll be thinking, and I hope later talking and discussing about the ethical and or religious reasons why we think what we do about some of the issues that come up at the beginning of life. But first, some disclaimers. The first is that I am not an expert, especially on frameworks other than Lutheran ones. I know a little bit about a lot of things, which means I have a great time on Jeopardy, but I'm certainly not an expert. And probably what I know least about are secular humanistic or non-theistic ethical background. So I'm hoping that as we get into discussion, for those of you who use that as a framework for your decision making, that you can help me understand where you come from. The second disclaimer is that the perspectives of the various religious groups that I'll be mentioning are not monolithic. Lutherans, the group I know best, usually put out social statements, they call them, on various ethical or political issues. And these statements are voted at on a national conference, but they are never uh, universally agreed upon, never unanimous. So that's, that's just Lutheran. So I'm assuming that other gatherings function the same way. Now, with all that said, let's move on to looking at the framework for some of the decisions that are made regarding the beginning of life. Probably abortion is the first hot button topic that comes to mind for me. And after doing some reading, it looks to me like Unitarians already have done a lot of thinking about this topic. So I'm gonna to spend more time on, on other issues. 
As a generalization though, I think it's safe to say that most of us make decisions about abortion based on when we think life begins. And for the Roman Catholic Church, decisions about abortion and birth control for that matter, have to do with discussions about when the potential for life starts and the need to defend that even potential for life. Interestingly enough, and I didn't know this, Buddhists also are unlikely to support abortion because of potential lives that may be lost. I thought that was interesting. And Judaism, although there's not universal agreement from what I've read, tends to maintain that life begins at birth and abortion, especially to protect the health, the physical health and even the mental health of the mother is certainly allowed. There is discussion though about other grounds or rationales that would be permissible for abortion. Christians, of course, as you know, are all over the map on this one. Some beginning life believes at conception, others not. And you can see that difference in different religious groups approach to abortion. But let's move beyond that to think about some other life issues. And to do that, I'd like to start with the framework that I'm most familiar with, the biblical one. And for me, that means going back to the first book of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, specifically the first chapter, the 28th verse. This is after God created the world and everything in it, including people. And after this took place, God gave people their first marching orders, which were to be fruitful and multiply. And that seems pretty simple, at least not many words. The only problem is that it doesn't give a whole lot of specific guidance to modern day folks who are trying to find their way forward in a time when technology has raised questions that our ancestors were nowhere even near close to considering. So let's start with some of the questions that have come up in our own lifetimes. What does it mean to be fruitful and multiply in a world where raising children and providing for them can be an expensive proposition? And I don't need to tell that to those of you who have children. I checked the other day, and the most recent estimate for raising a child in the United States from birth through age 17 is $233,610. And that doesn't include any kind of higher education. So in that case, does being fruitful and multiply mean that we shouldn't have any limit to the number of children we have? What does that mean when making decisions about birth control an area where different folks have come down in different places. What is our responsibility in providing for our children? Be fruitful and multiply. Does that mean we should be doing anything and everything we can in order to have children? Does that mean that surrogate mothers, artificial insemination or frozen embryos are all okay? Is there ever a time when a couple can decide not to have children, given the risk of a genetic disorder or personal preference for that matter? Should genetic testing be mandatory for all those who want to be parents? And as we get closer and closer to a time when we could conceivably modify our genes and our offspring, what should our guidelines be? And John started to speak to some of that. Of course, given a choice and given the ability, we would want to remove horrible, crippling diseases. But what about choosing traits where you could almost design your child to be a great basketball player or another Einstein? And who gets to decide what the choices should be or what's allowed? Should genetic revisions be made that affect just an individual, the individual whose genes are being manipulated? Or should those changes be made that affect later generations as well? And that's some of the discussion that went on with the CRISPR technology that John referenced earlier, that the scientists tended to be more optimistic isn't exactly the word I want, but wanted to be more in favor of genes that would help a particular individual rather than modifying genes that would cause changes down through later generations. And these are only some of the questions floating around. And my guess is that as time goes on, there are going to be more questions, not less. And they'll be even more complicated. It's almost enough to give you a headache. Ah, you know, it's enough to make you wish that life was simpler. 
while it's not my intention this morning to give you a headache, my hope is that this morning we'll have a time to be thinking about a possible framework to help us as we work through these concerns and ones that we haven't even thought of yet. And I suspect that on many of these issues, you may have a gut reaction as to what's acceptable and what isn't. I know I certainly do, but I think it would be helpful if we did some thinking in addition to just reacting. So where do we start? For me, it begins in Genesis. Hold on a second. Alexa, stop. I have no idea why she started, but she did. So where do we start? For me, again, it begins in Genesis, that first book of the Bible, where that's where we learn that the divine made us in the divine image as beings that think and feel. God gave us brains, and I suspect we're expected to use them, especially when it comes to caring for the world and other people in it. And I think there's rejoicing whenever something that's gone awry in creation is made right. And I believe that we're supposed to be using the brains that we've been given. Throughout the Bible, the scripture that I read, there are lots of stories about people being healed and healed in order that that person may be restored to community and to family. And in many faith communities, there are prayers for healing for those who are ill so that kind of restoration can happen. But it's complicated. If you were in charge of fixing medical problems and you could, which would you fix? What would you eliminate from the human gene pool if indeed it was that simple? Diabetes, Down syndrome, nearsightedness, a certain level of IQ or general klutziness, something else? I guess the bottom line question is, as I asked earlier, who gets to define what humanity should be like and what would be a desirable outcome? If you could somehow question the divine about the desirable traits for humanity, what qualities do you think would be selected and which would be eliminated? And I'm not convinced that our list would be the same as a divine one. Just about every time I hear discussions about technology and reproduction and what we can do and what we shouldn't, the question is often raised as John raised in end of life issues that we are playing God. And that playing God is what we do whenever we don't let nature take its course. In some ways, I think that's a valid issue to raise. We are not the creator, at least not in the same sense that God is. We can't make something out of nothing. And I believe we need to maintain some humility, especially as we're confronted with some of the amazing things that we're able to do in human health and welfare that weren't even dreamed about 50 years ago. But also, I guess you could say that we play God all the time. When we give our children or ourselves take antibiotics or vaccines, when we get vitamins or tetanus shots, if we ignored all the scientific advances that have been made in our lifetimes, we and our children would not be nearly as healthy as we are now. The question, and a very important question then, is where do we draw the line? And whether or not you believe in some kind of divine being or creator, how do you make decisions about physical or mental conditions that should be either promoted or eliminated? And what's your standard? And those discussions are getting really heated. For example, there are those in the deaf community who are excited about the possibility of having hearing restored. And there are others who believe that deafness is not something to be healed but of a part of the culture that's to be celebrated. Recently, I've heard similar discussions about mental health. Should those diagnosed with manic depressive tendencies be treated to remove those tendencies? Or are they an important creative part of individuals that should be celebrated? And now there are all the questions about mandates for COVID vaccines and the religious basis for exceptions. How do you decide? And as I look, at what I've written, I see once again that I've raised many more questions than given answers or frameworks for decision-making for that matter. Maybe that's because the best way to come up with our framework is in discussion with others, to bounce our ideas off each other and to hear other perspectives. Whatever sacred texts we consult, assuming they have not been recent, written recently, are open to interpretation and application to new challenges. 
whatever philosophical approaches we follow also need to be applied to new situations and those which are yet to come. As technology evolves, it will be important for us to think and reason to go together in questions that will affect us all, regardless of the ethical framework we follow. We need to keep talking, and I hope that will start to happen today. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and, you know, I, Reverend Cheryl had told me that when she was taught in seminary to give a sermon, she was taught that it should be about 15 minutes long. And the question is, why 15 minutes? And when she told me, that is a time frame usually between ads on TV, therefore thought to be the capacity of the human mind to pay attention. Uh, so I think, well done. A great deal was transmitted in a short time and left a lot open for discussion. Uh, so at this point, uh, you know, let's do what we Unitarian Universalists do best, which is to talk and discuss. And so the floor is open for any and all who wish to offer some thoughts. I have some of my own, if no one chimes in, uh, to begin and energize a discussion. Alan, I'm expecting you to offer some thoughts, if no one else. Uh, Dave's hand is raised. Yes. Well, Genesis 128 says, be fruitful and multiply. I think by now we can safely say we've done that. We've taken care of that task. Let's go on to the next thing. I don't think that was meant to be a commandment to last all eternity, no matter what the circumstances are. So let's not be quite so fruitful, not multiply quite so much now. We're crowded. Yeah, Dave, I, I, I was struck by that. Um, of course, I know that's in, in Genesis, um, but, but I, 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 yeah, I, I think that perspective is uh, we've multiplied enough. Maybe, maybe the, the correct way to think about it is um, maybe just repeating what Dave said, multiply enough. I think overpopulation is a really, really, really at the core of a lot of problems. Yes. And, you know, and, and, and I think one other thing about that is that um, I, I'm a human being, so I favor human, human beings, but I don't think that we should ignore other species, plants and animals <laughs> and plants. And I think that human beings are, are, are crowding out um, all other forms of life um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that I find aesthetically displeasing. Um, so I, I'll stop there on, on that, that component. Um, one could say that when you assume an authoritative role in an organization or a country, or a family, you're playing God. Um, and also what when you decide what will be written down as in the Bible, you're playing God because your definition, your human definition of what is what should be is um, is sort of making that statement what what you think is okay to do um, and certainly evolves. So it's, it's really hard to say what, um, and I know Cheryl is saying this, it's hard to say that um, we know what is good um, and what is true as time goes by. So playing God, I think, is the biggest and most difficult part of this. And actually, we do have to play God to move forward, to know what is right and what comes from whatever is divine in us. <laughs> I'll just make a quick comment on that. I, I do. I, I personally don't think there's any 
absolute truth that there's no standard that is ab that we can go to and say that is absolutely morally correct and something is absolutely morally wrong. I just think it's it's a decision of human beings. And if one believes in the in in the Christian Bible, that's also a decision. So I think that's reasonable to make that decision, but it's reasonable not to make that decision. And then it's left to us to, 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 to think about what we, it's an emotion, what we emotionally feel is right. And I think what, what Cheryl said is I agree with very much. It, it, it is an emotion. I, I don't think she said that, but, but, but I think it's an emotion, but to supplement that emotion with, with trying to understand the implications of a moral decision. If we, and, 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 and understand that in thinking it through yourself and also hearing what others feel about moral decisions. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe that's unclear, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I try not to make purely emotional decisions. I'm not necessarily at my best when that's all that's operating. So I think, as you said, to supplement that with some kind of, of rationale is helpful. And that often comes with listening to others. My comments, you know, obviously, not surprisingly, would come from a sense of a medical background and, and that knowledge base based upon over four decades in the field and seeing things change over time uh, from a time when, you know, in medical school, the whole concept of even having defined our genes didn't exist at that time. We hadn't mapped the entire genetic map of human beings, and that has happened in my career. So a couple of thoughts. For example, people will look at individuals with ADD or ADHD and you know find them a bit maladaptive in our society, most different drugs to try to make them more functional. But there's some research that would imply that that was a survival benefit for millennia in human beings. You know, wouldn't you want to have hyperactivity and hyper awareness if things around you might be there to kill you and eat you? Wouldn't that give you a survival advantage? Now, again, that's not helpful today because that was when people lived in nature and had a lot of space to move around. Today, kids with ADD in school are a misery to themselves and a misery to others because they don't sit still. They're square pegs in a round hole. So we, vet, we drug them in a sense to make them fit into our construct. But when they get out of school, they often find a job or a position where that becomes a helpful uh, process where they do well to have that. So again, if one were to say, well, maybe we can eliminate that, and not so fast. And the second, <clears throat> which is a corollary, if you believe in Mendelian genetics or in survival of the fittest, you also have to believe survival of traits may have a benefit. And so I made a comment, you know, that which persists may be of value to us or to society potentially because it survived. It's still there. After all these millennia, it is stuck around. And again, that's just a slow process of evolution of these traits. You know, do we dare to meddle with that in looking at the long arc of time when we, when we start doing, again, cloning or selectivity in terms of traits, even medically, if you were to alter the genetics of a person, their DNA, if that will alter what goes out in an ovary or a, in the sperm. Now, the ovaries we don't care about because they're all placed there before the child is born as a female. They are all there when the child is born. So actually, we can't mess with that we probably can't mess with the germ cell line in the testicles in terms of what's generated there, but uh, that's beyond my, my genetic knowledge. So we have to be careful if we do a focal change to make the life of a person, for example, with multiple sclerosis better, if that could be done, although that's a brain thing, if we can help acute cystic fibrosis and on and on. If we delete something and make their health better, so they now secrete a different enzyme or stop hurting themselves. Aside from making them live a better life today, what will happen in the next many thousands of years if there's some unintended consequence of that manipulation? And again, I don't have that knowledge. I'm not a geneticist. It's just a concern.
I once read a sci fi book that was set in a future where you could have your genes, the genes of your children skewed to be the best possible genes for whatever that particular future was. And it tended to be um, tall, symmetrical people that were highly intelligent, like that it's skewed towards skewed towards that. And the um, the thing that was and, and people who were very good at um, computers because computer programming was what this particular side environment needed. What I thought was very interesting was that they imagined that this would not have been available to everyone. It would only be available to the rich. And so what what would that kind of, I thought that was an, an interesting look at what would that kind of um, societal divide do? And it actually, in this particular book, it divided society even further because there were these people who had everything plus perfect genetics, and then there was the underclass that didn't have anything at all. And who would be allowed to vote? Just the, the people with all the top genetics or everybody? In this particular sci-fi environment, um, it was a dystopia, so really no one was voting. Um, it was all corporations, but people were able to advance in the corporation based on their ability to do computer programming and their ability to, um, it was actually, it was interesting. This came out in the early 90s, I believe, and um, it was functionally people who were producing YouTube and TikTok videos, and that was how they gained power. And I was like, oh, oh, that might not be good because you can <laughs> see what would happen if just the rich people, like you can see on TikTok now what happens when just the, the rich, beautiful people are producing all of the things that people believe. And, you know, that's how you go around getting the Tide Pod Challenge. And if you haven't heard of the Tide Pod Challenge, then don't bother to look it up. It's dumb. I haven't. Fine. It's, it's uh, people deciding. So Tide makes these little pods and they are very colorful. And it's a bunch of teenagers who stick the pod in their mouth. It's Tide. It's not edible. Don't, don't try to eat Tide. Anyhow. <laughs> I Wait, think, no one, sorry, go ahead, Alan. I think, I think, Maybe I'm going to say the obvious and what's already said. Uh, um, messing with the germ line is 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 dangerous uh, because it extends way into the future. But I do believe that we that there are. I think we could make decisions that would satisfy me emotionally um, about th that certain diseases are bad for human beings. And, and if we could genetically, you know, uh, um, uh, um, Duchenne's dis muscular dystrophy is, is, is probably the worst imaginable situation. I don't know how many, uh, Emily shaking her head, you know what that is. That is so cruel and so terrible. And there are other things um, th th that I think we shouldn't hesitate to try to eliminate those things. Again, we run into the problem of overpopulation if we cure too many. You know, there's, there's a certain value to death um, in, 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 in human life. Um, the old get uh, uh, swept away and new things emerge. And, um, and so, you know, I think it would be good to eliminate, I think we could safely eliminate a, a variety of diseases. I, I, you know, there are things which are more ambiguous, like, like, like ADHD, as John mentioned. And so I think we, we ought not mess with those. And the other concern is um, we don't want to eliminate death, I think. I actually heard a new story about that. If we could find a way to live forever, then we wouldn't need new people. So if we could eliminate death, then we could eliminate birth and just 
people we have now live forever. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Mm -hmm. I think for me, for, for, for me personally, that there's some <laughs> attraction to that. But I, 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 I think on some aesthetic level, and I appeal to aesthetics because I don't know, you know, I don't talk to God and, 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 and I don't know what God thinks if there is one. So I, I, I fall back on the word aesthetics. It, 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 it's an aesthetic displeasing proposition for the only people alive today to be the ones that, are the, that persist. And, and so I, I would, if, if I had the power, I wouldn't eliminate death, even knowing that I am going to die. One of my concerns has always been, and I've, I may have brought this up, you know, in other contexts, uh, maybe other services I've done, but the human mind is egotistical and self-centered. Um, and yes, there are people who have pure motives, people in research who are developing uh, technologies to meddle with genetics who probably have pure, pure motives, at least theoretically. But that will not be true of what happens with the discovery as we are well aware as time passes. And so I've often made the point that I don't think humanity is mature enough to grasp these technologies and to make good, you know, decisions that benefit all because we just don't, I just don't think we have that capacity. We see it, you know, we see it in politics, we see it routinely. You know, what about, again, this is a Reverend Dave Ballywick, but what about voting rights? In a sense, that's a value judgment that's being made by conservatives that certain people are not of sufficient value or wisdom to vote, aside from the fact that it won't benefit them on their side. But if something as, I wouldn't say trivial, but if something as mundane as that troubles us today, I can't wrap my head around what would happen if we get to the bigger issues of cloning, genetic manipulations, and so forth, which have, in a sense, higher stakes that could live on for millennia beyond the present time. And, you know, John, maybe to build on, on that point <clears throat> at the minute, you know, I, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, if the story or the history of humanity is that, you know, often, you know, progress is not linear. You know, we, we sometimes, oftentimes maybe have learned things by taking things too far, <clears throat> learning from that and then pulling back. And I, I wonder where we are in that cycle with this topic too. Yeah, I'm thinking of like reproductive assistance. And I know um, lots of stories of people firsthand, secondhand, who had trouble having kids and got what ended like... Um, like IVF or something like that and ended up with, I mean, in addition to many frozen embryos, things like pregnant with triplets and the first two are choking off the lifeblood to the third. And then that third baby almost doesn't get born, almost dies first, is born with lots of um, <clears throat> impairments or even if we're talking about one embryo being planted, that that baby has a lot of genetic, um, I guess people would say imperfections and needs lots of medical care. And it m makes you think a little bit about natural selection and playing God and what the ramifications of that are. And I, I had made this comment in my sermon of the service we did about abortion and various views of, of religions. But, you know, when I first went to practice, if a child was born much before 32 weeks, they probably weren't going to do very well because we didn't have the technology and the support systems that we have now. And in my career, the age of what I would call you know, useful viability, a child that will survive with good overall function of brain and body, you know, not just surviving and having cerebral palsy and multiple deficits, that timeline has gone back further and further. Yes. You know, there now have been babies weighing less than one pound, 15 ounces perhaps, who have survived, and I 
don't know the future. I believe they may have survived with good life, uh, with a good life, because just keeping little people alive is not a virtue in itself if the quality of life is terrible. But, you know, we're getting closer and closer to a point where one has to, again, whatever you believe about abortion, you have to decide, you know, again, this is a human decision that we have to come upon. And I know it's being going through the courts now of you know, when, when should abortion be outlawed? At what point? I don't believe in total outlawing of it, but we've got to be careful, you know, with late, with mid trimester uh, elimination of what could be a fruitfully healthy child because the technology exists now that that could be a living person as we keep on slicing the point of viability in different directions. And to comment about Cheryl's comment about the Jewish tradition, in Judaism, uh, for better or for worse, the life of the mother has always taken precedence over the life of the baby or the fetus or the embryo. And that's been a long-standing tradition in Judaism, which is obviously in contradiction to the beliefs in, let's say, Catholicism in particular. I want to just say that um, Unitarians um, like myself, it's it, when you don't have a ultimate authority, when you don't speak to God, um, everybody has to make their own decisions. And, and a lot of it comes down to, to emotion. Um, what, what does seem right to you? And, and that's, and I, and I just want to add to that, that I think that societies can work that way. That societies that have, that, that, that don't have a theistic view often are not necessarily cruel or, or bad. That people come to agreements that, that a lot of us would, would endorse about what's a good society to live in? Don't you yeah, so think leave. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kay. I was going to kind of let Reverend Dave and Cheryl give the final word. Well, don't you think that common sense, um, such as it is, and justice and accountability is more of what we try to aim for? I mean, there is there such a thing as common sense? It's not just your emotion. It's what you feel is right. That's that's my thought. It's not mm -hmm. somebody telling you what is right, but what you feel is right, and and the majority of people feel that it's right. So oh, you just feel. So we'll have we'll have more time to talk after the service is finished because you know being who we are, we can go on for hours on end, uh, and not that it's a bad thing, but just to kind of keep to a timeline, then transfer over to the less formal session. I think the appropriate thing is if Reverend Shallow or Reverend Dave have a final. Uh, a penultimate or ultimate comment. I think they're in the best position to summarize. And then we'll, we'll close after that. And then again, we'll reopen for discussion right afterwards. Yes. I'll leave that to Cheryl. Okay. <laughs> One of my favorite books starts with the sentence, life is complicated. And that's certainly true. And I guess I would just like to push back or find out more a little bit about a humanistic framework for decision making, because I think there is a basis on which our common sense operates or, or some, maybe the better question is what's the value? Is the value uh, a lower population? Is the value individuality above other things? How there's, I'm convinced there's something rational, well, <laughs> some days more rational than others, but there's some kind of thought process that goes into making decisions beyond just emotion. And I'd be curious someday to find out more about that. Okay, so again, we're simply closing the service, not closing discussion, you know, far be it. Um, I'm not sure if we lit a chalice, if there's a flame floating around someplace that can be extinguished, so be it. And whether we can see it on the screen or not, my comment is that even as the light of the chalice is snuffed out, may its light remain in our hearts and minds for the week upcoming. And my, my final words or my benediction, such as it came from my brain is, May the great power that energizes your spirituality grant you peace as you navigate our increasingly complex world of changing ethics. And I will finally, I will close with uh, namaste, shalom, 
may it be so. And um, we will now transition to the famous tradition and universalist and Unitarian traditions of the coffee hour. 